Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and a vice chair of the New Urbanism Division. And I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, September 11th, and we will be hearing the presentation An Integrated Approach to Community Development and Planning, Resident Engagement, Neighborhood Assessments, and Evidence Based Outcomes. For any technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call the 1-800 number shown in bold. For any content questions related to the presentation, you can type those in the questions box, which is also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions. Thanks to all of the participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to their members. Today's webcast is sponsored by the Mississippi chapter. To learn more about our chapters, you can visit planning.org slash chapters. And to learn about our divisions, visit planning.org slash divisions. On your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. To register for these, just visit our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, uh, just Go to your dashboard on APA's website and you can select activities by provider. That's the easiest way and select today's sponsor, the Mississippi chapter, and then the title. Uh, I will tell you that this webcast is still pending for 1.5 CM credits. Uh, I think that's because it's it's conference season and uh, APA is, is backed up with, with a lot of uh, with a lot of folks inputting sessions for their state conferences. So just check back um, on our webcast webpage, or you can just check back uh, on your dashboard at, at uh, planning.org. So when this will be approved, just so you know, it is for live viewing only. So some of our recorded webcasts are available for distance education CM credit. So you can check to see which of our sessions are available for that by going again to our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcasts. And like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information uh, on our sessions. And we are recording today's webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel right after the session ends. You can just go to youtube.com slash planning webcast or just search planning webcast on YouTube. And uh, we will also have a PDF of the PowerPoint. It'll be available at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Again, just scroll down towards the bottom of the page and, and you'll see previous uh, webcast PDFs that you can download. Okay, I'd now like to introduce our speaker today. It's Joan Marshall Wesley. Dr. Joan Marshall Wesley is an associate professor in urban and regional planning at Jackson State University. She teaches courses in the community development and housing and planning theory. Her work emphasizes the intersection of community inclusiveness and empowerment, environmental justice, and social equity to promote health, resilient, and sustainable communities. Joan has worked with private, public, and nonprofit organizations and community neighborhood associations. Her work includes community asset mapping, project development, program evaluation, and community-based participatory research. Joan's been an active member in the Mississippi chapter of APA for more than a decade, coordinating the annual student poster session at the chapter's annual conferences, chairing the awards and nominating committees, and serving as central regional representative. She also holds membership in several APA divisions, reflective of her research and advocacy interests. Joan has published several articles, singularly and collaboratively, related to environmental justice, social equity, and more recently, assessing nutrition environments in a South Jackson community. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joan.
Thank you, Christine. I appreciate that. And thank all of you for uh, participating with us today and joining this webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. All right, so as Christine indicated, I'll be talking about an integrated approach to community development and planning, and the emphasis will be on resident engagement, neighborhood assessments, and evidence-based outcomes. I want you to take a really good look at this first photo here because I'll go back to it at the end of the presentation or toward the end of the presentation because it kind of goes to the, the heart of what we're doing. So again, we're looking at how we can integrate approaches to community development and planning, but we're particularly interested in how we can engage residents within communities to become a part of that. And so just to give you a short overview of the session, I'll be presenting an integral approach or an integrated approach to community development and planning through resident engagement. I do have one overarching objective, and that is to explore ideas and strategies to involve residents in assessing conditions that may promote or impede community wellness. The primary focus is going to be on resident empowerment, and we will We'll talk about looking at empowerment by providing tools to evaluate community conditions, such as housing, social concerns, economic opportunities, infrastructure, and environmental issues. Also, I'll be speaking to how community stakeholders working collaboratively with planners can optimize outcomes by incorporating diverse approaches to community development. And I use the word planners here to include practitioners, of course, but also academics and students who are very much involved in our planning processes. I also have several subsumed objectives that we'll be discussing, and these will look at an examination of the potential for creating strong community-based organizations, again, through resident engagement. Uh, I'll talk about ways that we sh should consider which should be effective to involve community residents in assessment activities, that is, engaging them in what we call community-based participatory research, and presenting possible areas to evaluate community conditions. And then, of course, I'll present and provide some strategies and ideas that are relevant to working with community members on how to conduct assessments and document the findings. I'd like to start out by saying that we have like a 10-step process that I use when I'm working with students and when I'm working in communities. Because typically, anytime we're having these involvements, it is a collaborative process, and community members are always actively engaged in everything that we do. And so steps one through three will look at identifying the issues or issue. Uh, we will determine data needed to document what we're looking for. We, of course, will engage stakeholders, and stakeholders may be community residents, they may be elected officials, they may be planning uh, professionals, and certainly students, um, other professors. We just want to bring as many people to the table so that we can have as many voices as possible. Steps four through six look at educating or orienting the community about the processes involved. And five is collaborate, 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 collaborate. Again, looking at how we bring all of these different voices to the table so that we can have these, this diverse range of ideas. And, and hopefully, we'll get this tapestry of ideas and we get better ideas so that we can reach better and informed decisions. We identify the partners who are going to be involved, but we are particularly interested in identifying partners who can provide us with resources and the data that we need to conduct our research. Also, in steps one through nine, one of the things we really, I think, sometimes don't give enough attention to is our intergenerational efforts. How do we involve you? What is it that we can do to bring them so that we can inculcate in them a sense of community, a sense of civic responsibility for ensuring that communities last for not just the time that they're going to live in them, but that they are sustained, where if they want to stay there, they can live, work, play, and grow old in those same communities. 
and then the research. We get down to the nuts and bolts of what we're doing with community-based participatory research. We have both qualitative and quantitative data. Now, I know people oftentimes, especially people are, are researchers who tend to be oriented towards quantitative data, oftentimes um, think it's superior to the qualitative data that we have to collect from communities. I think they deserve equal attention because even though we have a lot of data that we can get from census and other sources which are primarily numbers, until we go into communities and we're working with communities and they're actually involved in conducting the research with us, we don't always have the qualitative information we need to make the best decisions. And then of course the write-up and present the findings. Step 10, evaluate efforts and make necessary adjustments. Now, one of the things I will say about this is I have it for number 10, but even as we're going through the entire process, every step of the way, we should actually be evaluating efforts and seeing what works, what doesn't work, what needs to be tweaked, what needs to be adjusted, so that when we get to step 10, we have the kind of product, or at least close to the kind of product that we really want to have. Now, I'm starting here with maps because maps are really important in terms of doing what we want to do in communities. Maps give us boundaries of the target area, where we need to work, where we need to go. We can have all of the goals and objectives in the world, but we have to some, have some place to target them. If we're working in the downtown area, for example, and even though we're talking about community-based participatory research, Possibly people could be working in the downtown area. Community residents are very much impacted by what goes on in downtown areas. And so just for the sake of example, I've included two maps here. One is the Central Business District of Jackson, Mississippi, and it's, um, it's probably two or three years old, but I don't think it's changed any. Uh, and the one on the right side of your screen is a neighborhood map. This is a map we used when we were conducting community-based participatory research in one of our neighborhoods in the West Jackson area. Now, this is only one of many um, neighborhoods that make up the West Jackson community, but we did work specifically in this area, and we were primarily focused on asset mapping, our asset-based community development, and so these are the boundaries for our neighborhood uh, targeted for the study. So we'll talk about, for a second or two, uh, some of the tools for community-based participatory research. The first one I'd like to mention is asset mapping. When we talk about asset mapping, we're really looking at an approach that's based on identifying strengths, positive aspects of a community, so that there's more emphasis on the qualities, the positives of a community. Community members and community members as researchers identify and document existing resources and include in community development work and the goals. We always start out with some goal in mind, even though we know we may have a significant number of issues that need to be addressed, it is typically useful to at least set up goal with goals with objectives in between so that we can have measurable kinds of successes along the way. So assets then may include institutions, individuals and their skills and talents, citizen associations, amenities, and other positive resources identified within a community. Now SWOT is something that we use. I don't use it uh, as frequently as I did at one time, but I think most of us are probably for, familiar with it. It actually stands for strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats. And when we do this as part of an evaluation process for communities, we are actually looking at community conditions and the potential for development. And we also think in terms of, based on the identification of strengths and weaknesses, we think of these as actually falling within in the realm of internal issues. Strengths and weaknesses often refer to internal conditions, uh, whereas opportunities, opportunities and threats often target uh, those conditions that are external to the community. And then assessing and evaluating. 
we can use certain tools to assess and evaluate community environmental infrastructural and social conditions through observation and documentation. We do a lot of this in on-site observation research. Uh, one of the things we, we talk about, especially when we're working with uh, students, is to let them know it is fine, you, know, you drive through, and of course we always have these cautionary notes about going into communities, uh, even though most of them are certainly by and large quite safe. But there are benefits to going in in groups of two or more. Number one, people can kind of feed off of each other's ideas. They can document uh, individually, but they can also have discussions along the way, which often trigger new ideas about possibilities and things that they might want to do. And so when we're assessing and evaluating these environmental conditions, there are ways that we can document them. And I'm going to cover that in uh, the next slide. But again, this does require on-site observation, getting down into the community. Community residents know that. They live in the community. But sometimes when people external to the communities, for example, their partners or students who are working with them come in, they tend to develop a different perspective or they begin to view it through a different lens. And sometimes things are brought up or shown to them that they may never have thought about before. They've seen things but they've never really looked at them in a different light. And so oftentimes when students go in to work with them, they can view some of these conditions through a different lens. Asset mapping. Asset mapping, again, we're looking at some of the positives about a community. And so when we look at asset mapping, we're thinking about things like what schools are in the communities, any institution of how you're, how you're learning, uh, education, uh, whether it's elementary, junior high, high school. So we're essentially looking at schools at any level. They could be private schools, public schools. But when we do asset mapping, we want to inventory all of those things that are related to our institutions of, of learning. Churches, temples, synagogues, other institutions of worship are really important for communities. Uh, these are oftentimes the, the glue that help keep community members together. Um, many of us think about worshiping in places that are important to us, and oftentimes we want to do them close to home. So if we're doing asset mapping in a community within targeted boundaries, we want to inventory the churches, temples, synagogues, and other institutions of worship that, worship that may be available. Also, we want to look at financial institutions. I have banks listed here, but they could be credit unions, uh, any kind of, of financial institutions. Grocery stores, farmers markets, retail outlets. We could have community gardens as part of the asset process, asset mapping process, because community gardens have become quite popular in a lot of areas. And it's really interesting because almost any community you go into now will at least have some conversation about community gardens, whereas others have actually implemented plans to hold have community gardens and actually invite people in to uh, gather vegetables or fruits. Some of them work their gardens year-round. Others typically hold out and just do the spring and summer gardening. But uh, community gardening, our community gardens are really important assets to consider when doing asset mapping. We also have to look at homes. Oftentimes, our communities have gone through a lot of transition. And so we tend to see a lot of the things that need to be corrected in homes. But with our asset mapping, and we can, we can talk about some of these other things, but in our asset mapping, our focus is on the positive. And so we want to identify the homes that um, do look like they've been well-maintained. The lawns, the gardens are well-maintained. They may be single-family or they may be multi-family. We want to log in mixed-use and mixed-income units. Health services, identifying what health services may be available. Some of the communities we've worked in, health care systems are right in place. Large hospitals, you can walk across the street and uh, take care of your health care services. Others are not quite as fortunate. Uh, one particular 
community we worked in didn't have the hospital with all of the many health services that it provided inside of the community, but it was right on the periphery. So it was very easily accessible and they included that as part of one of the assets within the community. And then of course social services. Oftentimes the communities in which we work, which are often underrepresented and marginalized, have a tremendous need for social services. And so if social services are a key part of what people need to ensure their wellness and ensure the sustainability of their communities, then we certainly need to look at this as a positive. And so we include this as, as part of our asset mapping. Sidewalks. For a while, over the decades, sidewalks seem to have disappeared. Now it seems like more of the newer developments actually include sidewalks as they are uh, building new houses and new subdivisions and so forth. So sidewalks are typically considered a key part of an asset within a community. Biking and walking trails, where people can walk. Are there trails? Are there parks? Are there designated walking trails within parks? Do the walking trails actually have designated areas where people can determine how far they've walked? Are the biking trails separate from the walking trails? Do they run parallel to each other? All of these factor into assets for a community. What about well-maintained streets? Again, we can often focus on all of the, the issues that happen with our streets, cracked, um, they need to potholes, uh, they're cracked, the concrete's uh, cracked, you, you drive over them and, and run into all kinds of issues. But there may be positive things that we can identify with streets, about streets in our communities. And then properly dra maintained drains. Parks, ball fields. These are great amenities for communities that we certainly want to include when we're doing asset mapping. Recreation facilities, uh, community centers, which may provide after-school programs for children whose parents work and who are not home at the time children arrive from school. And then what about transportation options? Is public transportation available? Is it readily available or does one have to uh, walk a mile to, to get public transportation? And is the public transportation reliable? Is it on time? So if we have a good transportation system, it's reliable, it's dependable, it's on time. Uh, people know that if they need to be to work at 830 and they have to catch public transportation, that that transportation is going to be there in place when they need it, and that's an asset for that community. We also need to look at cultural activities within a community. Individual and group skills, talents, and training. Sometimes, and, and this oftentimes falls well down the list when we're doing asset mapping, and I think as we bring community members together, it's probably one of the things we'd like to inventory early on. When we bring people to the table and we invite people to meetings, whether it's an initial meeting to try and organize or whether it's an ongoing meeting from neighborhood associations, it is always beneficial to inventory individual and group skills, talents, and training. And oftentimes people, especially retired people, have tremendous number of skills that they can offer and are willing to provide those skills to people who may need them. So that's, that's a real asset. If there are retired school teachers, for example, or people who are willing to tutor students who may be having difficulty in school, they have those skills, they have those talents, they have the willingness and the time to do it. We need to list these as part of that asset under the individual skills and talents. And then capital. Most of us who deal in planning, all of us really who work in planning, always talk about capital. I think there's a lot of emphasis on social capital. And so certainly social capital is extremely important, but I've listed all five of them here that we typically talk about when we're looking at community development, and that is these capitals are social, financial, political, physical, and human and intellectual capital. They're all extremely important for community development. They're extremely important to inventory when we're doing our asset mapping because they're the things that bring our communities together and keep them well and whole. 
So how do we document findings? When we talk about documents, documenting findings, we have to conduct our site visits to whatever study area we've identified with community members and other collaborators. Again, remember the emphasis is on community-based participatory research because we want to involve all community members in conducting research in their own communities so that they can have input about decisions that will ultimately impact their lives. Again, it's an empowering experience, but it also ultimately helps in, in making them self-determining as communities. So when we conduct site visits to study areas with community members and other collaborators, we want to document any findings we have. So what we want to do as we go through these areas, and again, we have to get out, we have to experience these communities, whether it's downtown or whether it's in our actual uh, residential areas, we need to get out, uh, feel the community, see it, hear it, understand it, really experience it up close and personal, and then we take copious notes about our experiences, things we've discovered, conditions of the natural built and social environments, and there are environmental clues all over when we visit a community. We need to record, copy, photograph important documents. And I will get to this in the next slide or two in terms of uh, actually uh, making sure that we have copies of specific documents that we need that comprise part of the data that we're collecting. But we need to record, copy, and photograph important documents. Take pictures to capture conditions which will support our written notes, and then our written notes can be revisited and reinforced with the photographs we take. So it's kind of a check and balances. And if we're working collaboratively with, with other people or if we have a partner or two that we're uh, doing this research with when we're in the community, then we can kind of share notes and, and have some exchange in terms of what our findings are what our perceptions are, and really get engaged in the process. And what we have found with, committee, with community members is when they begin to do this, they really become engaged and enjoy it. Photo voice is something that we hear a lot of. It is a concept. It is a methodology. We hear an awful lot about it, but, often, but we probably have not utilized it as often as we could or as efficiently as we could. What I have found in communities is that when they are allowed to or they are oriented on how to use photo voice following the specific protocol of it, they find it generally enjoyable. It is also user adaptable. Elderly people can use it, young people, children can use it, and it requires a specific protocol, I should say that. The work may be problem-focused or general when we're using photo voice or any, any other kind of documentation or taking photographs or even notes. We may use regular digital or cell phone cameras uh, to do all of this work. And now everybody has a cell phone, and so that makes it really easy. Digital, phone, digital uh, cameras are great because we can just come back in and download them. But we can also do the same thing now with our uh, cell phones. And everybody has a cell phone. Some people have given up their cell phone, their landlines in favor of cell phones, and most of them have cameras on them. And then an assessment sheet. We'll talk about the assessment sheet, with, which includes what we do for asset mapping, the SWOT analysis, and then use of EPA tools that I will get to also in a couple of minutes to identify and document environmental justice issues. This is just an example of something that I pulled off the Hines County, Mississippi website. It's a land roll query. I don't need to spend a lot of time on it because you'll have access to the slide. But what it does is it, 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 it just shows us that anybody can go in and with a little instruction or reading when all else fails read but with reading the instructions or getting instructions from people at the tax assessor's office, these things can be uh, explored and we can document information in terms of property ownership and related information. Another example of where we can find data, information about a community's demographics, census tract, and other information may come from the Federal 
Financial Institutions Examination Council, FSIEC. Uh, they rely on census data. HMDA is another site. HMDA is, of, of course, the acronym for the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. I, I use it often because it's kind of a quick way that if you have certain basic information, you can just go into the website, which is listed at the bottom of your screen for both FFIEC and HMDA. And in fact, if you Google HMDA, H-M-D-A, it's going to bring you up to the FFIEC website, and you get lots of links that you can actually go in and look to see what you need to do to find information. They rely, as I indicated, heavily on census data. And just to show you, give you an example of that, these, these are data collected for Honda. And what I did, I just chose an address in Flowood, Mississippi. I, I took out the address, so all you see now is Flowood, Mississippi. But on the, the left side of the screen, you see the MSA, the Metropolitan Statistical Area Code, uh, the state code, the county code, the tract code, the census tract code, and then the MSA name, which is Jackson, Mississippi, uh, the state name, Mississippi, and then the county that it's in, of course, it's Rankin County. Um, if you look to the right side of the screen, this is a tract income level. Again, this is kind of a quick way to do it. I often give this site to my students because oftentimes they like to just go in and, and put in their home addresses or their parents' addresses, and you can do the same thing. Just go into the site, put in your address, and you can get all of the census uh, tract information you need about the area in which you, in which you live. So the income, the tract income level is middle income, as you can see. Uh, the second uh, column there, underserved or distressed tract, is no. Some of the addresses you put in, especially if you're working in underserved communities, it's probably going to show that it is a distressed census tract. But this one, of course, is not. And if you'll look at the next column, the 2015 FFIEC estimated MSA, Family income is 58400 And if you look at the track, estimated income for 2015 is 68000 And that shows up that us that that census track compared to the median family income for uh, the MSA is significantly higher. The next column shows the 2010 tracked median family income, which is 63000 $634. Well, again, if we're making a comparison, just within that census tract alone, within five years, we've seen there's been an increase in the income, which is a little bit different than what we're experiencing in a lot of places nationwide, where the income is flat in a lot of areas. Tract medium uh, family income that presented is 116%. Tract population, you can see it's quite small. Well, no, it's not that small for a tract, 7,400. The track, the percent of minorities is 23%. Uh, minority population is uh, 1,720 and so forth. And it also shows you the owner-occupied units, the units with one to four uh, family units, and then again, reemphasizing that the track income level is middle income. So if you, you'll have access to the slide, so you have the web, and all you need to do is copy and pasted it into your browser and go to that site. Or if you're not you know, anywhere near this uh, slide at any given point, if you just remember HMDA, H-M-D-A, the acronym, Google it and you can find all you need. So assessing conditions through community-based participatory research. Some possible community conditions to evaluate. We're a little bit away now from uh, the asset mapping, even though in this situation, I think we can find some, some possible uh, positives here. So when we do the community, assess community conditions, we may be looking at both positive as well as not so positive conditions within the community. And if you look here, the photos that are listed, that are shown here in your slide, are the community store, country store, um, apartment, restaurant, and then a nonprofit community-based organization, which is located in the western area of, of Jackson, not too far from Jackson State University. Another way we can assess community conditions 
if you look at the left side of your screen, we see a way to look at housing assessment. We can look at the type, tenure, size, location, the single family, multifamily. We can look at the value and the ownership. Again, this, I can use my mouse here, this indicates the land roll information that I showed you a little bit earlier that we got from Hines County. So we've blacked out or redacted the information we don't want you uh, to see because it personalizes and, and we don't want any personal information out there. But the idea is to show you what can be done and if we can do it, students do it, they work with community members and they're always excited to learn that they can do it and where to find it because there's nothing wrong that they can't do it. Oftentimes it's just not knowing where to find uh, certain data that they would like to do in order to continue moving their communities forward and to realize some of the goals and objectives they have set for their own communities. On the left side of your screen, this actually came from a project we conducted in a community, and we used a very rigid standard that we got from HUD to determine infrastructure and housing conditions, well, specifically housing conditions, not so much the infrastructure conditions. But if you'll look at all of the this one, this roofing, this is side, I think this looks like a window here, and this is like the, the corner part of a roof, and this is the siding. And then this is a driveway that one of the students um, identified that needed some repairing. But the others have to do with actual housing conditions, and they use a very strict protocol in determining whether or not an area or whether or not a house would be indicated as needing repair in poor condition, fair condition, good condition, and so forth. Asset mapping and assessing community conditions often go, almost always in fact, especially uh, when we're doing the, the assessing community conditions, we will almost always include some asset mapping components in there. So in this particular photo, we can look at uh, churches, one church, a school, and then what looks like a ballpark or uh, looks like a ballpark. So what schools, playgrounds, or institutions of worship are located in or in close proximity to the community? These are questions we would ask when we were doing the research, we're doing observation research, we're documenting our findings, we're taking photos. Are the communities pedestrian friendly and walkable? This is a really big thing especially in Mississippi because we have such an issue with obesity and I don't think that's a, that's a secret that's known nationwide that we have just a little bit of an issue with obesity. So that people have access to sidewalks and are in communities that are walkable becomes really important. But the other thing that we have to look at, I think it's, we, we, we have to, begin looking at more and more as planners is as we develop our areas because we're so we, we're still kind of following a lot of the sprawl models that were set up earlier and so I see in our area a lot of new development going around it's close enough to housing areas and to businesses healthcare facilities but there's not a single sidewalk when they're actually in close proximity where they should be able to walk or people who frequent at work at these facilities should be able to walk to some of the, the uh, restaurants that they use. Asset mapping and assessing community conditions again when we look here. Does the community have health care facilities, parks, playgrounds, recreation, access to healthy food, grocery stores, farmers markets, community gardens? Again, you know, if we have fast foods or uh, sometimes convenience stores, we can certainly find food at convenience stores, and we can find food at fast foods. Do we have health access to healthy food options? I think it is more, more and more common that a lot of the fast food places now do offer some healthy menu options. Assessing community conditions again, as you can see here, there's a, a probably a lot less to be hopeful about, and these pictures again were taken in one of the one of the courses. Uh, that's one thing I like to use my students 
uh, photographs because they do a really great job in terms of capturing what it is that they need to capture in terms of assessing community conditions. So if you look here, and just going from left to right and looking at the road conditions, the street conditions, uh, obviously we see this unit here in the middle of the street which says that there's probably a pothole, something that could probably create damage to an automobile if it, if it falls into it, if the tire hits it. Uh, the photo right next to it, you can see the road doesn't look in very good repair. It looks as if it could benefit from repair. And certainly uh, the ground surface all the way over to the left, the top, I'm sorry, the top right uh, indicates that there's a serious need of repair. At the bottom left corner of your screen, there is a sidewall that someone was able to capture, and so you can see the housing development in the background, and then there's some there's the curb that's very close to the sidewalk. Um, that's I think more and more we see that, whereas in a lot of the older subdivisions that we we visit, oftentimes we see the sidewalks, and then we see there's a buffer maybe that's well tended with plants and grass and so forth to kind of add as a buffer between the sidewalk and the uh, vehicular traffic. And then the center on the bottom, again, this conveys to us that there's an issue that needs to be attended. We see the drain here, and it's probably going to have some issues in terms of uh, stoppage because debris is probably going to float into it from some of the other areas. And then, of course, the, the dwelling on the right bottom of the screen conveys a home that is well kept. It looks like it's in, on a fairly large lot, so it's, pro it's in a rural, a relatively rural area, even though it's considered part of the urban, Jackson urban area. It's a little bit more rural, but you can see that the house is looks fairly new, it's modern, the grounds look well kept, and it's on a fairly large piece of land. Again, assessing community conditions. If community members were to describe what they see in these photos, what would they say? You know, that's one of the things we ask them when we get them back to the table, and we're able to share some of the photographs with them, and, and we have the notes, and we compare what they see with what we were actually able to see through the lens of student planners or plannings because, planners, because sometimes we see very different things. And I think one of the really great things about working collaboratively with communities, and what's great with communities working collaboratively with planners, is we get to have that exchange of information and get to see uh, situations and communities through the lens of each other and, and understanding why that's important. Again, this is the, the picture that I showed you at the very beginning of, of the presentation. So if community members were asked to describe what they see in this photo as part of a community-based participatory research project involving photo voice, how do you think they would describe what is happening in this neighborhood? And I think that's one of the really, really great benefits of photo voice, even though it's a very, it, it observes in its purest sense, it observes a fairly strict protocol, but it's certainly worth something um, putting to use for community-based participatory research. And it's, it's a kind of research and methodology that community members really enjoy and appreciate. I'm going to talk a little bit about environmental issues and environmental justice. Many of the communities in which planners work or where they conduct most of their work, or a significant amount of their work, I should say, is probably in underserved and underrepresented communities. And as such, they are often also disproportionately represented when it comes to issues of real or perceived environmental injustices. And so when we're working in communities that are concerned about environmental injustice, we can provide them with some of the tools that they can utilize themselves to identify what's happening around them. The EJ view, which is 
formally known as the Environmental Justice Geographic Assessment Tool, is a mapping tool that allows users to create maps and generate detailed reports based on the geographic areas and data sets that they choose. Um, I was on the site uh, a couple of days ago, and I have been on it intermittently for the past couple of years, but it's been a while since I've been on it since the, the, the time I wrote an article about environmental justice and municipal solid, uh, solid waste landfill siting. And the, the site itself has changed in terms of how data can be accessed. I think the, the really great thing about it is that there, there are so much data available. I guess the, the challenge would be is because there are so much data, it's very much like the census site. So you just have to work with it a little bit so that you can actually access the data that's needed for your particular project or your particular research. But what happens with um, EJ View is that you, people can actually go in and look at the, the geographic assessment tool because it is a mapping tool and you can put in all kinds of variables to get the information that you want. So the EJ view includes data from multiple factors that may affect human and environmental health within a community or region, including demographic, health, environmental, facility level data. So this, when, when we talk about Doing these assessments, we have to think about scale. Even though I'm saying community-based or focusing on community-based participatory research, we can conduct research, this kind of research, at any scale. We can do asset mapping at any scale. We can utilize the EJ view and the ECHO tool at any scale. And so the only thing we need to do is to become well-versed in it ourselves if we want to share it with our communities, and we can then teach our communities how to use it. And I, I would say that it does, of course, require technology, obviously, computer access to Internet. And I think one of the myths that we're beginning to uh, debunk more and more is that elder people in, the commu in our communities don't have access to the Internet, or they don't know how to use technology. While that is true for some, it's also true for some younger ones. But many elder people in our communities, and these are underserved, underrepresented communities, are quite proficient in using the internet and uh, researching using the internet. They use Skype. They use email. They know how to do these things. They communicate with their children and their grandchildren via email and Skype and all, all kinds of, of technological requirements that are needed for. Uh, doing those kinds of functions and engaging with their family members. The other one is ECHO that I want to talk just a little bit about. ECHO is the, that's the acronym for Environmental Compliance History Online. I've actually identified a site here that we could just kind of look at, and you can go back after the session and pull it up on the Internet. I didn't you know, do anything to make that available via the Internet so we could actually do that while online here. But there's a site that's uh, identified in Gwinnett County, Georgia, and is in Loganville. Well, the address is here, and the, the site name is listed here. And then these data that show beneath that are data within a three-mile radius. You can also pull up data within a one-mile and a five-mile radius. So three mile radius was, was up on the screen when I pulled it up and I thought, well, I'll just go to it. Uh, so that's what I did. And so the data that we have here are data that show what's happening and what the demographics look like within a, five, a three mile radius of this site. So the racial breakdown in persons percentage of white, uh, almost 22,000, and it's 54.5%. African American or black is 14.2,000, 35 35.45%, um, Hispanic origin, a uh, little bit 3,700, a little more than 9%, then Asian Pacific Islander, 1,200, 
almost 3%. American Indian, only 130 with 0.32%. And then other multiracial that they've kind of collapsed together. This 2,700 and comprises about 6.7% of the population within a three mile radius of this site. The site also provides age, income, household, and education info. There are two other sites that I want to tell you about. One is Right to Know, and the other is Scorecard. At one time, Right to Know and Scorecard both were just kind of our go-to sources for people who were really interested in environmental justice because um, there was the idea that we could get really objective data on environmental infractions and environmental issues that were plaguing communities and communities who were, were really up in arms about. Well, it, it kind of disappeared in its purest form for a while, but I noticed more recently it looks like it's back. I think it's, it's a very, they both are very user-friendly applications, and I've included the website. All you need to do is copy it and paste it into your browser and go to it. But just looking at Right to Know on the left side of your screen, Right to Know gives an in-depth pollution report for your county. And it covers air, water, chemicals, and more. So we just wanted to include some of those. You can get the answers to the most commonly asked questions on nationwide pollution. And I put this in quotation marks because it comes directly from the site. So what I did was I input two zip codes. Uh, one is the area that we just talked about in Rankin County, 39232, which is in the Jackson Metropolitan Statistical Area. And the other one is 30046, which is in Gwinnett County, Georgia, um, Lawrenceville. So on the scorecard part, we can get an in-depth pollution re report for the county, and that covers air, water, chemicals, and more. Scorecard is sponsored by Good Guide, the world's largest and most reliable source of information on the health, environmental, and social impacts of consumer products. If you want to find products that are healthy, green, and socially responsible, uh, this, is their little, this is their little pitch, their marketing piece, then you need to support them by downloading the Transparency Toolbar uh, at the mobile application. Now, just to warn you that that's going to come up, but you don't need that to access the data you need. So if you go to the scorecard site, you can get answers to questions on the nationwide pollution. You can find out who's polluting, what pollutants, do the most harm, which is really important because we want to know which ones are, are, are extremely harmful, or, you know, whether or not they may be uh, carcinogens or whether or not they may be mildly harmful, except if, if it's health. Uh, I don't know that we consider anything mildly harmful. Uh, where is the worst pollution located? And then we can compare communities and states. So we get all of these capabilities from scorecard. Again, I've just kind of downloaded, uh, copied and pasted some of the information from the Right to Know site. Again, looking at the in-depth pollution reports for the, the county covering air, water, chemicals, and more. You could get answers to some commonly asked questions on nationwide pollution. Again, looking at the zip code that I told you about a second ago, uh, 39232, 30046. Uh, and then we can actually look at the toxic releases to the environment. And we can compare what happens in Hines County, Mississippi with uh, Gwinnett County, uh, Georgia. So this is kind of interesting because that's not really Hines County. But anyway, if you go in and do that, and that's, this is copied and pasted, so it doesn't copy and paste as clean as it shows up on the website. And because it is done like in um, almost like a bar format, it's very easy to read and it's very easy to access. So it's something that we can use that's very user friendly to us. And then that would make it easier for us to share that information with our communities as they look for ways to actually get involved in 
conducting community-based participatory research. Again, if we look at the toxic, toxic releases to the environment, and they, they use theirs from cleanest, best counties, the national average, the dirtiest, the worst, and then we get it by the counties, we get the percentages. They do the same thing, that site provides us the same thing with air, with water, and also with land. So, as we talk a little bit more about and kind of actually wind down here in terms of objective assessment, equal evidence-based outcome, I want to talk just a little bit about how we evaluate and document stated goals and objectives against outcomes. What we know that we really need to do whenever we've, we're going to decide on any project within a community, we, we want to have kind of a clear path of where we're going. That's not always the case up front when we decide that something needs to be done or the community decide there's something that needs to be done. We know we have some serious issues here. We can identify several issues. We kind of don't know where to start. So what we can do as collaborators in this community-based participatory process is to help identify and tease out a rank the important issues that need to be addressed, beginning with the first and just kind of going on down the line. Now, that can be done through group processes, and I think that would probably be the desirable way to do it because, again, hopefully if we're, we're facilitating groups and so forth the way we could, then we won't have one person or one idea that's dominating the process, but we'll be getting input and feedback from a group of people who, um, who, who want to uh, get involved in that. And so what we want to do then is to go ahead and identify a goal or a specific goal. And then we identify community-based research goals and then the objectives that are necessary to get to it. We want to check throughout the process to ensure the objectives drive the work that we're doing. We want to document all findings using conditions captured through our photos as we completed our observation research on site. Uh, we want to record accurate data relevant to the work and conduct continuous evaluations of the work, checking for accuracies, inaccuracies, discrepancies, using our photos and our notes to kind of do check and balances to make sure what we're doing is accurate before we present it to anybody. And then photo voice, which is used to document experiences and community conditions. Uh, and remember, again, that is a specific process that requires a specific protocol that I, I didn't include in this presentation today. And then documentary photography, which is a little bit different from photo voice, even though photo voice probably evolved from it in some way. But it tells stories about the strengths and weaknesses, positive aspects, and less than positive community conditions. Again, looking at data from EPA's EJView, ECHO, um, and then the Right to Know website, as well as scorecards to provide documented data about environmental issues. This is a list of the resources. We are at the end of our time, and I think we've dug pretty much to uh, our 1 o'clock end time frame, or 2 o'clock if you're, if you're on the East Coast and if you're from the West and you're a little bit behind us. But these are the resources that you can use and you can go to. You will find them, I think, ex extremely useful. And I think there are also resources that could be shared with community members as they are engaged in participatory research. And again, I'm Joan Wesley, uh, Associate Professor here at Jackson State University. This is my email address. You can feel free to contact me via email or telephone if you need additional information on anything that you would like, but we've not had time to cover in this session. And so I would like to acknowledge, if you'll notice there, some of my students who were instrumental in getting some of these photos. And so it's always important to acknowledge our students and the work that they do, and they, they've done a really good job in engaged in community-based participatory research, asset mapping, and 
looking at and assessing community conditions throughout several communities in the area, in the state. So again, thank you for joining us. And I'm going to turn it back over to Christine for Q&A. Christine. Thank you, Joan. Um, so uh, folks, please feel free to get those questions in. Um, there have been a few questions regarding whether this presentation will be available. Yes, it will. Uh, there's a, uh, a PDF of the PowerPoint will be available after the webcast ends uh, on uh, our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And it's also being recorded and will be posted onto our YouTube channel. Just search planning webcast on YouTube. And folks, go ahead and uh, let those questions come in via your, your questions box on your GoToWebinar toolbar. Um, it looks like we have a question here. Please describe how Photo Voice works and what is the protocol? OK, Photo Voice um, actually is photography. But the protocol is, is, is quite extensive. Typically, what we do is we, we have a group of, of people who, are, who want to engage in taking photographs to document uh, something about a community or community condi conditions and, and, and so forth. And so we try not to have really large groups in it because, or even if we do, we'll have to break it out later, because we start then with orienting uh, the group about what photo voice is, the benefits of it, the purpose of it. And then from there, we tell them that they take photographs of a specific project or a specific area. Um, we used it a while back for looking at nutritional environments, but it can be used for anything. That's one of the really great things about it. It can be used for almost anything you want, it to, do, want to use it for. You just need to follow the protocol. So you, you gather the group. You give them an orientation in terms of what photo voice is, the purpose of photo voice. You explain to them how to use the the camera and how to take pictures and to be sure and take, um, especially depending on what you're doing, because you may want to do both positive as well as not positive um, conditions of a community, for example. And then once that's done, people come back together, your group comes back together, and you will hold a focus group. That's where it really gets kind of interesting because you don't want more than about 10 people in a focus group. And what the focus group does then is they download the photos and the, the facilitator of, of the photo voice process will, will talk about uh, what the photos are and select some to, to show to the entire group. And then as the photos are flashed on a screen or are shown to the entire group, then, then they give feedback in terms of what those photographs convey to them, what they see in the photographs. That's why um, on a couple of the pictures I indicated are asked, what does this photo say to you? What does this picture say to you? And so that's part of what uh, the protocol is about. And then after that, if you want to do uh, a document to write up findings, you actually, if you want to write an article from it, you can write an article from it. You can write it up as part of a community document. But the, that's the protocol. It sounds, it's, it's relatively straightforward. But to do it correctly, all of the pieces do need to be included. OK. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm not seeing any other questions come in right now. Um, so I, I guess what I always say is when there aren't any questions, that means either A, you've answered everything, or B, you've given everyone so much information that they don't even know what kind of question to ask first. <laughs> so either way, you did well. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly available, um, call or email, you know, anybody who may have additional questions because I do understand, you know, especially with some of the specifics we talk about, it's difficult to cover everything on screen um, to include in a presentation. Absolutely. And but Absolutely. I'll move. Please feel free to, to contact me. And those, those links on your previous slide will also show up in the, uh, the PDF of the PowerPoint if you want more information on, on all those great resources. Okay. Well, thank you, Joan. Um, and I, if Mo is still back there, the, the PDO <laughs> of uh, the Mississippi chapter and also one of your colleagues there at Jackson State, uh, thanks to him and to the Mississippi chapter. Um, 
And I think that's it. So we'll just go ahead and wrap up a little early today and feel free to email Joan if you have any other questions and we'll get everything posted shortly. So thanks everybody and have a great day. Thanks. Thank you, Christine.